Confidence. It's not just one thing that can create confidence for us as elk hunters. Instead, as we've shown in this series, it's a constant circle. It's about attitude. It's about skill set. It's about work that we put in. Results, trust, belief, and perspective. Today, we wrap up our confidence series with final thoughts and answers to our viewers' questions and comments. So y'all pull up a chair, adjust your volume is just right, and let's get to it. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk County. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host Gilbert Arnellis and elk hunting coach Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Elk Camp. It's your first time with us. Glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those of you blue collar hunters out there following our show, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of the show from Spring, Texas, and all the way from New Mexico, our elk hunting coaches, Joe Gillia and Leroy Chav Chavez. How you guys doing tonight? We're doing great, yeah, Gilbert. Welcome, good. everybody. Awesome. Well, as you know, it's our time of the show, Joe, for yep. our Elk Bros shout outs. Time to shout out, bud. You bet. If you're new to the show, and uh, these are about a few of our cities with the most listeners out there topping our charts this week. That's right. And, you know, even though we're recognizing this week's listeners, because what we do is we take a look at the show um, when it comes out. It comes out Tuesdays. And, man, I'm telling you what, I get up at like – sometimes 5 30 in the morning and it's already been hammered with listeners which is way cool and i go That's and so awesome I, I take a look at those first cities that really start hammering it and 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 our, our listeners and and i just kind of record those down so we can make sure that uh you know we give a shout out to those people and we're going to do that but what i want to do first is I, I really would like to also give a shout out to those cities that have been our top five listening base over the long haul. In other words, we're looking back over about the top 10 episodes and got to give huge thanks to Denver, Albuquerque, Elko, Nevada, still hanging in there. Way to go, Elko. Man, you're H-Town. H-Town you got to be proud of those guys over <clears throat> I there. I am. Super and, proud uh, of my boys. And Phoenix, Arizona. And I just want to thank them for their continued support. We're, we're you know, we're really happy to have you guys uh, listening to us and sending in questions, and that, that's real huge for us. So now I'm going to go to this week's listeners and topping the chart this week and earning our Elk Bro shout out for the top one. If you're ever in the area, don't miss the lunch of chicken salad on Lancaster bread at Carla's Kitchen, or, and I had never heard of this before, cheddar beer soup across the street they say it's outrageous man absolutely so, a uh, huge shout out to lancaster lancaster wisconsin yeah, buddy <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome joe yeah i've had that cheddar beer soup and it's fantastic really? yes sir in, in wisconsin it's a really good soup yes sir you know i, I think to I, give it a go huh? I, I think i'd have the 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 cheddar and a beer, you know. Yeah, man. <laughs> get it right We're not going to discriminate, that's for sure. <laughs> get them mixed yeah. up. Huh? Okay, next up is the home of Prince. This city's name in Dakota Sioux means the tree with sweet sap. A blue-collar shout-out to Chan Hasten, Minnesota. Yeah, it's either Chan Hasten, Chan Hasten. Guys, if we pronounce it uh, wrong, send us a email <laughs> send us a, phonet, a phonetic email right yeah yeah there you go and we <laughs> will sure. correct ourselves man absolutely we definitely well, want to lord knows my grammar could use some correcting i know that's <laughs> that's for sure uh known for its cutting horses and labeled as the peach capital of texas is fitting for me to give a shout out a big thanks to our listening base in weatherford texas my 16 new team will be in Weatherford this weekend playing ball. So, oh really? Big shout out to Weatherford. Y'all keep it keep it real and keep listening to our podcast. We appreciate it, guys. So, so who's going to be putting it out to who on that game there, Gilbert? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's your team with the the hat that you're wearing. 
The, the Texas Hawks. Hawks. Yes, sir. Yeah. So yes, the Hawks are in the house tonight. The Hawks are in the house tonight. Y'all caught me coming back from ball practice real quick. So, uh, yep, we got the Hawks shirt and the Hawks hat. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to wear a different hat every time we do a podcast, Joe, and see if we can't start something up. Maybe our listeners will send me a hat or two, and I'll I'll put it on for them, repping their companies or whatever. Yeah, and we got to get those uh, Elk Bros hats done up, bud. No doubt, no make doubt. Those things happen, and, yes, and we got some we got some camo to show yeah. people on that, man. We get yeah. that. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. Next up, uh, okay, listeners, see if you can guess this one. It was once the capital of California, and its complete name was once included El Pueblo de Guadalupe. El Pueblo de Guadalupe. Mm-hmm. And hmm, I got people out there, and it's like Jeopardy. Yeah. Gee, James, if James was here on Jeopardy, he'd be kicking it right now. See, <laughs> where is it? Okay, the answer is San Jose, California. San Jose. San Jose. Shout out to San Jose. Guys, glad awesome. to have you listening. And last but not least, known as the Magic City. And the name of this city is a French word that translates to mean three French bushels. So it's about <laughs> volume is what it is there. Right. Mino. South or North Dakota, guys, man, I don't want to get the North and South. So that's that's Minot, North Dakota. Is that how that I, is? Yes, sir. I've spent many, many days Minot, in Minot. Yeah. Uh, I, sp- I, you know, I worked a lot in the oil field up there between Williston and Minot and all that North Dakota stuff in the Bach and play. So, uh, yep, Minot, North Dakota. Oh, cool, man. Well, we're glad to have yes, somebody sir. that's a world traveler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I just look at that country. I'm, 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 you know, I've been around a little bit, Joe. <laughs> I am around, but I've been around, no doubt. <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> you guys, today we wrap up our confidence series and right. answer some questions from our listeners. You know, uh, we've got some fantastic questions from our viewers. Yeah. Um, and I want these guys out there in in in, uh, in elk country to understand that no question asked is a dumb question. The only dumb question is the one you didn't ask, right? Right. And we uh, we want all, all of our listeners, whether it's elk or deer or whatever they're doing, to feel free to send us those questions. And, right. And yeah. Rate and review us every day. So. Yeah. And we, we appreciate it. It's, it's our lifeblood, man. It really is what we, what we want to do is help, help our listeners every day. We can't do that if we don't have the questions and comments. And I tell you what, it was really cool to get some, get some emails and stuff. And we're going to go to those in a few minutes. But I thought the three of us, um, we ought to kind of wrap up this series and, and talk a little bit about a few of the things that uh, either you, we might want to add, if any of you guys want to add to that on our conference series. Because, I mean, when you think about this, this has been, I don't know, it's been like a six week, seven week type deal that we've done this. And, and it's really been, you know, when we talk about confidence, we started in the beginning talking about our ring of success, you know, the type of things that each person had to do. And, you know, it's like you said, at the very top of it, it's that constant circle of attitude and combined with skill sets. You have to put the work in. And we talked about how everything's result driven. When you get out there and practice and, and you get uh, that skill set of your shooting fitness uh, and you're seeing that, you know, you're pegging it, those results really start to drive home and that starts to build confidence. And you, you add that in with, you know, your confidence in your gear, all of those things. And you start to have that trust. You start to develop that belief when all of those pieces of the puzzle start to come together. A real important thing that we talked about there in that circle, though, was also keeping everything in perspective. Because, you know, it's like me and Chad were talking just before the show that Chad was saying that one of the things that stuck out in your mind about this was – you said something about uh, it's about time to start every year. Yeah, you start that process every year right about summertime. You know, you go through that whole process of, of gaining confidence in your shooting ability and going through all the different steps to get better. But once we get close to uh, the summertime, start. it's time to start getting ready again because yep. you got to get in shape first. And, yep. you know, that's probably the first thing. And getting in shape gets you ready to shoot. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's just a, an ongoing process. And as you go through that, you get better and better every year. So it's one of those things. It, and that was the main thing. Everybody remember it's a process. And like I told, I have always told my athletes, you know, I, I coach just like you, Gilbert, Yes. Sir. You know, each year those kids come back and they think that they start where they left off. And that's not always the case. You have to continue that process. You're only as good as the time you put in. And I, I, you'll I get think, back just what you put in. Right. Yep. And I, th- I think it's cool because, you know, Chav's talking about how now it's summertime and it's time to get to work. Well, on our Instagram, on our Elk Bros Instagram, what I really like seeing in there is all these people that are pushing each other throughout the winter. Mm-hmm. You know, they're out there. Uh, as soon as the snow gets off the ground, they're hiking for sheds. Everybody's doing pictures of them, you know, taking shots and practicing and fitness is really a huge thing. You know, guys pushing each other, trying to stay in shape. And that's one thing that I enjoy about seeing on the Instagram is how everybody really pushes each other to stay in the game and to be the best that they can once they get there. So Gilbert, did you have anything from the series that stuck out in your head? You know, I just think the content that we, we gave our listeners was, I mean, it really was 35, 35 plus years worth of, of what drives our confidence, you know, and when you got guys like you and Chad, they've been doing it so long and you've developed such a, a, a confidence about y'all's style of hunting, I think the, just those things that, that stick out to me are too about being disciplined in your practice and about being disciplined in having an approach, you know, and having a, a, a place to start, like you guys said, in the, in the early spring months and, and just starting to get yourself prepared for what's coming, right? I think you can't you can't prepare enough. And for us flatlanders, I mean, you guys live in altitude, but for us flatlanders, it's even more important, you know, the in shape part, because look, there is nothing that can kill your confidence more than when you get up there and you're having, you're not saying we have to hunt at 10,000, but if you got to, and that's where they are, it's, it's very challenging on yourself if you're not prepared. Right. And you will understand real quick that, man, this this hunt is going to be so much tougher. And I wished I would have done this. I wished I would have done that. Every time I come back from hunting, I want to be a little bit better the next time I go. You know, know, we we talked about it in gear. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes for every part that we've talked about is identify your points of failure. Yep. Identify your possible points of failure and what you have to do to fix that and overcome it. Mm -hmm. And those points of failure are not just equipment. Those points of of failure can be our attitude. It can be our fitness. It can be our shooting. It it can be our calling. So you got to take that full picture. And everybody will work at the things they're good at, but they have a tendency to shy away from the things that they're not strong at. Yep. So that's where I want to tell people is find those possible points of failure, those areas that could make you better, mm-hmm. a stronger, more successful elk hunter, identify those and overcome those. So we're in your corner. We want that to happen. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I tell my athletes all the time, you know, we, <clears throat> I can remember three or four years ago, uh, we, we struggled at, at catching foul balls that were really high uh, and we struggled as athletes getting our body position and keeping our feet moving where you have to deal with the spin of the ball all the time. And it wasn't until we really, it's real hard to simulate that too off a bat. Uh So it wasn't until our coach, our head coach, Juddy Burks, he can, I mean, he's surgical with a fungo bat. He can actually hit that ball from home plate and sky it up over the catcher or sky it up to first base or third base. And I'm talking out of sight dang near, right? So they got to catch it. He's a, he's a Nassau hitter. He, he really is. And, <laughs> but, but what it did was it took us to where my kids, they catch every five ball that's hit. You know, right. because, but we never practiced it before because we couldn't simulate it. So it was a mode of failure for us. So we practice it almost every, every practice now hitting those big fly balls so those kids can get under it. And now it's like, oh man, 
you know, there ain't nobody going to hit it as high as Coach Juddy can ever, right. you know. Right. So right. it's the same thing with us uh, hunting. You know, if we constantly practice everything we're good at, we can never get better at our weaker points, right? Right. So I think that's important. I think you make a great point, Joe and Chad, to make sure we focus on what modes of failure we had and then attack that mode of failure and, and getting better at it, no matter you know, what I, it is. I can think back, and I tell you, you know, we talk about the successes we've had hunting, <clears throat> and we've been successful every year for, you know, uh, out of, you know, 33 years out of the 35. But let me tell you the amount of blown opportunities oh, where, where, where we learn from our mistakes, where, I mean, there was a time that you and I in one single day, I, <laughs> most, I wish people could have seen you, dude, because, you know, in one single day, we had probably – I mean, opportunities, we're talking shooting yes. opportunities where yes. we're on bulls in shooting range 30 yards under all the way to 12 yards and right. had six of them blown in, in one day. And, and <clears> just <throat> because things didn't go our way. And I mean, your head was hanging like a kid that had a sucker yanked out of your mouth, you know? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we put so much work in physically to have the rug pulled out from under you like that. It's right inflating, you know, and, and look, we put ourselves in those positions, you know, to, to get there and just the elk didn't work out. Right. It wasn't that I'm going to quote a really famous, uh, hunting guide named Carl Gamage, uh, one of our dear friends has passed on, but it just wasn't his day to die. You right. Know? And that's what Carl said. You know, he, he would say that quite often. And sometimes I, I fully believe you can do everything right and not win. Well, that's, sure. I, that's what we love mm -hmm. about hunting, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do everything right and not win. You can do everything wrong and still connect. You know, it's kind of like winning and losing. The things you only can, can control is your attitude and your effort, you know. So it's the same thing. Uh, well, how, how many times have you had a knock end up in your lap? Oh, you know? gosh. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least a, a half dozen times for sure. Yeah. And, and what, what we're talking about there is, is you know, Shoot we've finger. told people before, Chav shooting a, a, a real short bow with fingers, and mm -hmm. those knocks are not glued in a lot of times so they can rotate around. And he would pull back, pinch it, and next thing you know, he has a knock in his fingers and an arrow in his lap. And – we found that point of <laughs> failure and we fixed that. Point. Right. Exactly. We, yeah, we got all that taken care that's of. Taken that's taken care of. So. That's a thing of the past. Yeah, right. That, well, sure. we, you know, with confidence, you know, the success rate just skyrockets. Now there's always a chance that uh, you're not going to practice anything. You're going to go up there in your Levi's and bump into a six by six. <laughs> so that's going to happen once in a blue moon. You know, what we're talking about is having an opportunity every single year. Multiple opportunities. Yeah. yeah, multiple. Because no matter what you do, there's so many variables because each one of those situations, those six situations in that single morning, Gilbert, it wasn't even a, an afternoon. It was yeah, a, no, single this morning, a single morning. Yeah. Single morning. It started at daylight. Yes, at sir. daylight. And those different, each one of those opportunities, something different happened that we learned and kept in our database, but it's you know, the animals are going to do what they do and not everything's going to go your way. So that's mm. really critical that people understand that you need to create as many multiple opportunities. And that's the whole goal of everything that we're doing so that you can be successful on some of those because there's just crap that happens, man. It's just going to be that way. Um, before we get to our questions on our view and <clears throat> Did you guys have anything else that stuck out in your head? Because I have uh, some stuff that Lance Bernal had sent to me. He listened to our rifle series. And let me tell you what, the strategy series uh, for rifle and archery really has taken off. And I was really been really thrilled with how popular the, the etiquette one has mm -hmm. been. Uh, people are really going to that. And that means that, that's going to have a ripple effect that's going to make things better for all of us. But he has a couple of things here, but I wanted to check with you guys first is if there's anything else about the series that you wanted to discuss before I move on. Just that mm, I, I, had talk, I had talked with you about uh, when we were talking about the rifle shooting, and then Gilbert mentioned that, that the barrel could be different, a floating barrel or something. Yeah, right. So the guys weren't privy to that conversation. So when we were talking last time, uh, we were talking about putting the rifle on shooting sticks and we kind of want to 
be clear about that and some things. So generally, in order to be pretty steady, I always have my guy put that uh, just in front of their stock or the very front of their stock on shooting sticks. But you had talked about different types of barrels that can impact where you should be putting those shooting sticks on your forearm. For sure. Can you explain yeah. that real quick? Yeah. So uh, a lot of guns are free floating, right? <clears throat> so you can actually take a dollar bill and slip it underneath your barrel in, in between your stock, right? So right. That's, that's how you can tell if it's a free floated barrel or not. And those ones that are free floated or glass bedded, uh, they have room for that barrel to flex, right? And they actually, that's part of their accuracy plan. So when you let rest the barrel down on something hard, you've actually flexed that barrel in a different in a different mode. So it's not now resting on a bed. So right. it's usually multiple multiple shots are going to be different uh, if you rest it on the barrel. So it's been my it's been my experience that on those type of weapons, on those type of rifles, that you should only rest it on the fore end stock and not off the barrel. Right. So, uh, just want to make sure that we kind of put that out there mm -hmm. and people understand that I, where I have a problem and where you've got to be real careful is we had hunters that would want to rest that shooting stick way up close to that finger guard. Right. And there's not just not want. enough tripod stability in that for you to be accurate. So, Agreed. you know, the more you can get that towards the front of that stock or right the front, the, the better. If you're good on a tree, you're good on a tree. Each person has to do what they're comfortable with. So make sure that you do that. Um, Joe, I have a rifle right here next to me if you want me to show where I'm. What we're well, talking. I don't, I don't, I want to kind of move on because okay, cool. we got to get this show uh, done because uh, we're putting another one out and yes. we only have so much time we can do this month. So no uh, one thing I <laughs> wanted to talk about is Lance had sent me some stuff to just to remind uh, when he listened to it up at uh, Vermejo Park, Lance Bernal, the game biologist there. And, and going towards the gun, one thing he said that, you know, rifle hunters have to be careful of is they really have to be careful about picking a caliber that they're comfortable with because there's a lot of guys that shoot too much gun and they end up at a rifle range and that thing's banging the heck out of them. And I've seen this. I've seen guys get up there and they're on the shooting stick and – they have their safety on and they just really jerk that trigger because they're flinching because they, they're just not comfortable with that big of a gun. So make sure you're shooting something that you're comfortable with, that you can surprise yourself with that trigger. Another thing that he was talking about as far as strategies and we talked about the, but want to make sure it's clear and uh, is in your glassing techniques. It's always better to have in that morning and in that afternoon, it's better to have that sun at, at your back so that those animals are in that glow light and they really stand out. You get, mm, yeah. you really get that sun that just lights them up when, when they're on that hillside. He also said that, uh, you know, we talked about this when we're glassing, we're in or up high. You want to make sure that you're glassing timber and aspen pockets. So that's where we talked about where those big guys like to stay, where you have those deep crevices coming up, those those uh, deep drainages, and they get those little pockets above them where they have water close by, where they got feed inside of that, and they've got great thick cover. Those areas are specific to big bulls that will bury themselves in that. So don't forget that. Uh, one thing that was great that he reminded me that I usually don't think about as much. I do it all the time when I guide rifle hunters, but I forget to tell other people to do it is that if you have a call, I always have my diaphragm <clears throat> call and using that a call, whether it's an open read or anything, you know, we talked about how sometimes those animals, you only have a certain amount of time because they're moving. Well, if you give a call, you can stop them for that second so that that, shooter or if you're the shooter it gives you that time they're going to stop they're going to look they're going to just stand there and gives you ample time just to really surprise yourself with a good squeeze so that's a, a great point to remember yeah I've actually i've actually used my call on a shot at bull we shot 
or one of the guys shot at the bull and missed him. And I actually stopped that bull with a call and we got connected on the second shot. Right. So he ran about 60 yards. And then as soon as I cow called, he turned broadside again, you know, but had we not had a call, he'd have probably just kept going up the mountain. I had a hunter that I stopped a bull going across a park five times. Every time he'd wow. shoot and what he ended up, <laughs> his, his, he did something to a scope, ends up scoping himself. Ooh. bleeding like a stuck pig and uh to the point where i stopped the bull where he needed another shell and had to reach into his pack he's like throwing crap everywhere but you <laughs> know just bullets <laughs> cow call and stop that bull cow call and stop that bull so yeah the that call is a great thing and i think the last point that um that was really great that lance put out was if there's snow glassing those south and western facing slopes where that sun gets to hit that that's going to have that sun exposure, which is going to reveal uh, some of that feed underneath of that. So those are great places on that south side and on those western slopes to glass and look for those bulls that are out there feeding. So those were That's some great content. Sure, you bet. And Lance, uh, uh, thank you, buddy, for sending those in. I really appreciate that. And with that, I think we're going to move to see what the rest of our, our viewers that sent their questions. We had um, one, two, three. We had six questions that came in that That's we're going awesome. to handle. And uh, our first one was uh, Jason from up north from Minnesota. And his question that he had was, what would you consider proper etiquette for approaching someone's camp on public property? Because we talked about approaching each other as hunters. And, you know, he's wanting to know what we feel is is proper so jason myself and you guys chime in after i get done but proper etiquette is if you're coming by a camp and you see no activity at that camp when you're coming by it you keep on walking uh don't go near somebody's camp if you don't see anybody outside of it if they're if you don't see they can either be inside their tent sleeping and they need that during the middle of the day or there's nobody in there. And now if, it, you know, you see something that's going wrong in somebody's camp, uh, you know, a fire starting, you know, you act. But the proper etiquette is if you don't see anybody there, walk by. If you see some guys there when you're there and they don't see you, you just say, hello in camp and put your hand up and wave. And, and that'll open the door right there. And generally it, you know, gives you a chance. They, they give you a wave and they either come to you or you can just walk into camp and, and have a conversation. So, it, you know, that camp is their house for those days that they're there and treat it like that. So um, nobody there, walk on somebody there, hello in camp, announce yourself, wave, and you'll see if they wave to you and, and you can approach from there. Just like we talked about approaching other hunters, make sure any weapon is shouldered, you know, that, uh, that you look non-threatening in, in any way, be safe. Any, any, any additions to that? No. What do you think, Chad? I know. I think he, uh, hit the nail on the head. You know, if you see somebody wave and generally they'll say, you know, come on down. Uh, and if, a conversation. Yeah, definitely. If you don't see anybody there, just keep walking. Right. We, we've had several people come into our camp and man, we offer them food and drink and whatever. I mean, you know, we want to be treated the same way. So, I mean, right. grandpa said a long time ago, you get a lot more flies with hunting than you can with vinegar. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, I'd want to be welcome to somebody's camp. If I was walking by, I might be tired, need a drink or whatever, you know, uh, might need some help. You just never know. But uh, I, I've always been kind of want to, help somebody out if they needed help or if they came into camp, treat them nice. I, I have had some guys come into camp that uh, probably didn't want, didn't want us where we were or had a problem with whatever. And uh, it went fine, but you know, it's all really how you take it. You know, sure. and if you were yeah. nice to them and you've done your job, then it's up to them to reciprocate or, uh, or move on. But nine you know, times out of ten, everybody's going to be nice. And I, I'm from the South, and I believe in Southern hospitality, man. You, you know, 
treat people like they're they're a friend, a family member, and yeah. make sure they're not hungry, they're not thirsty, and uh, mm -hmm. and I tell you what, that goes a long way with people. So, yeah. um, next question. Uh, Great question from Jason. Yeah, that's awesome. Dylan from Kansas, and uh, Dylan wants to, uh, Dylan sent a, a big old letter to us, and uh, it was a great question because it's something that me and Chav, you probably think about this, Gilbert. Me and Chav never think about something like this, but he's from Whitetail Country mm -hmm. there in Kansas, and he said that he, he hears us talking about scent, but he never heard us ever talk about ground scent, which to a whitetail hunter, if you have a stand out there and you're walking back and forth and you're put laying scent down and a whitetail comes across your scent line in the grass, you're, <laughs> he's going to be heading out of the country. Sure. Right. right? Whitetail, pigs, I mean, they're very sensitive to ground, ground scent. Right. You know, so I'm Dylan not, wanted to know how elk react to ground scent. And he asked, will elk blow out of an area because of ground scent? And can you call them through it? And, uh, Anybody want to take that before I do? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give them what I've seen in my, uh -huh. in my in elk hunting. I mean, I think elk are tremendously sensitive to scent, right? Especially if you're calling and stuff like that, and they're looking for they're looking for a, a cow, uh, mm -hmm. which is typically what we're trying to sound like, or another bull. Right. And they they they're methodical too, man. When they're walking. When they're traveling through the woods, they got their head up. They're looking nine times out of ten. But I have seen them stick their nose to the ground, and they're you know trying to pick up that cow scent or she's you know urinated or whatever. And if they hit a scent line of a human, I guarantee you they're going to know it. I have never uh, had a situation, and most of the time it's not going to happen, Dylan, because you're usually generally approaching an, a an animal yeah. from an angle where you just haven't been anywhere and between you and that animal now if between you and that animal there's not going to be any kind of scent trail so uh, you'll notice bulls are a taller animal too and most of their time their head spent up and you'll see them stick that nose trying to get scent from as high as they can i've seen elk stick their head down to the ground but most of the time that I've seen it, it's one of those where they they think that there's something there, so they're going to kind of stick their head down, and they're going to be looking to see if you move when you when they stick their head down. They try to kind of catch you a little bit. But I have seen too many elk as well walk by camps mm -hmm. where people have been there that there's been a lot of people walking around, and I think it holds to what we talked about before. If that scent I use is mm -hmm. current and fresh mm -hmm. versus a scent. And a lot of times that sun burns that out a little bit. There's going to be a scent. They're used to smelling humans, but if it's light, they don't worry about it. So to answer your question, I think if you were set up someplace, Dylan, and that animal, um, and you've been moving, let's say you're hunting a water hole and you've been circling that water hole and they come and they smell something fresh there, they might be a little more on edge, but they are not whitetail edgy. They're definitely not that edgy. Oh yeah, not 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 at all. I mean, a whitetail will catch that scent on the ground. He's in another county. Right. You know, same with a hog. I've seen so many hogs catch a human scent where we've walked or something like that. Boom, they're gone. I mean, they right. Those those rascals can smell a grub three feet deep. You know, so I mean, I guarantee <laughs> you, they're gonna know what you your boot smells like. So our, our next guy is uh, Brian from Texas. Uh, man, I tell you what, and looking at our viewers, man, we got a ton of viewers out of Texas. That's really cool. It's a big um, state. Yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> um, he wants to know about possible effects of a campfire. Uh, his question was basically, can having a campfire cause elk to move out of an area? And as you guys know, we don't have a campfire in camp. And – Last you know, day. What's that? Last day we get to have a campfire. Last, last night. Last yeah. night. That's right. That's, and that's only for the steaks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. For the steaks or the boys to cook. Uh, Celebration night. Picanha. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's uh, uh, Manano, our, our Venezuelan chef, just 
live to cook that on the last night. And shout out to the Venezuelan mafia. There you go. And uh, I remember when he came into camp and he talked about his menu and, and I, and he says, you know, he had to build a fire. And I was like, uh, uh, we don't do a fire, man. I mean, I thought that poor dude's jaw hit down the ground. He was, cry. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, fire really is kind of a natural smell in the woods. So it's not so much that I worry about our campfire um, putting elk out of the area because I've seen elk in an area after a forest fire within a week after that. And you know, everything's still smelling right. there. Mm -hmm. It might not be a fresh fire, but I've seen them there. So, but for me, I don't want a fire that is going to smoke me up and make me smell like a ham walking through the woods. <laughs> so, right. right? Eat ham enough by itself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't want the boys with me smelling like a ham. Yeah. You know, number one, it, it's hard enough to hike all those miles without getting hungry. You know, right. you, you seen that cartoon with those two guys on the deserted <laughs> island, man, they look at each other. One looks like a hot dog. And it looks like a hamburger, you know, <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> but I, I really don't think, I don't think the fire so much moves the elk out of the area is, is I, I don't want, uh, I don't want any, my goal is to smell scent free when I'm yeah. going through there. And I, if you have a fire, it's kind of like bacon, do not get near somebody cooking bacon you know because that stuff will stick to you like glue and you're, you you got it with you so that's I pretty much on that bacon. <laughs> <laughs> um th the next one was from orlando he's from phoenix phoenix arizona he asked, country. he asked if we could talk about the gear needed uh once we have an elk down Great question. Orlando. Yeah, it's, it, it is a great question. And uh, let me tell you guys out there, uh, Gilbert, you were surprised to find this out about me. And it's like everybody that, that I know, we get an elk down. The first thing they see me doing is I'm putting, I'm putting those sleeve, I'm putting those sleeve protection things on and, and then rubber gloves and everything because I'm allergic to blood. So mm -hmm. elk blood, I'm, I'm allergic too. to that. And Mm -hmm. But I carry a kill kit, so I make sure that I have with me number one, you know, stuff that I'm that I'm going to need to do that. Uh, we all of us have a frame pack that has a flip out on the bottom, so that we can carry quarters out. We have that. I do not gut my animal. I do a gutless method. Uh, I've been doing the gutless method method for 30 some years and so we're going from the outside in that means i'm not splitting a pelvis i just need good sharp knives i need to make sure i have my tags with me i don't even carry game bags most of the time that could change for a certain type of hunt but with our type of hunt because we're going to pack and we're going to get it to a four-wheeler that's as close as possible i prefer to keep the skin on the animal. I want to get that thing. I want to get that quarter off as soon as possible, but I keep the skin on it until I get it back to camp to keep that as clean as possible. So that's just been the way that we've done it over the years. So as far as uh, the other thing in my, my kit that I have is just, uh, we'll put some paper towels in there. I make sure that in my kill kit, I have Ziploc bags so that when I'm done with my knives, I can put them in the Ziploc so I don't have blood all over the inside of my bag. I have a Ziploc so that when I take off all my gloves and the trash and the paper towels, we put that in. Gilbert, you talked about that you have the bottle of water and towels. Yeah. yeah and we're doing pictures for our, uh, you know, for our, uh, our cameras and stuff like we want to take as much blood out of the photo as we can with due, due diligence for the elk and pay honor to him and make him look as good as he can. That's pretty much as far as the gear needed. Mainly it's going to be a pack to get it out. You got to make sure you have sharp knives, make sure that you have a sharpener with you. So I keep a fold out sharpener so that I can hit 
those knives because uh, you start getting through that skin and start getting there, you know, you can, you can get dulled down a little bit. And you guys that use Havlon knives or the, you know, the outdoor edge knives that have the replaceable Correct. blades, make sure you carry some replaceable blades with you, especially because it's easy to break one of them, you know. And I, as, I, as also with, uh, you want to make sure that you have a Leatherman with you and something to pack those other blades in when you do that, yep. or, or that can become dangerous. You don't want to try to replace those with your hand. You end up cutting yourself. So, right. Right. And I hope, Good stuff. I hope, yeah. hope we're clear on that. So let's move to the next one. And uh, that's Chris from Denver, Colorado. And his question, and you had brought this up too, Chad. It's funny. Uh, yeah, if right. you're in the middle of nowhere for seven days, what do you do if someone in your party gets an elk early on day one? And the reason I brought that up is, um, you know, there, it, it's pretty, uh, it's been pretty much, yeah, it happens. Somebody always kills on the first day. <laughs> right. And uh, sometimes the weather gets pretty warm. And I can vouch that we haven't lost any meat when Ever. that happens. And Joel will tell you why. <laughs> yeah. So, Gilbert, you know what we do, don't you? Absolutely. What, yeah, we take, a bunch of, we take a bunch of ice into camp if we can on our coolers. And uh, we pack them in. And then as soon as we get the elk down, we get him deboned, put him on ice. And then we take him down the mountain or wherever we need to take him to. Usually we go back to Joe's house or wherever it is and then make sure we got plenty of ice on that meat and we drain the blood off and and, and keep it keep it iced down. And then we take take that ice back to camp. So we replace that ice and uh, on our way back to camp. Guys, if, if you understand something that when you get that animal into camp, we all work together and we debone that animal immediately there. And we get that in the cooler and we put that ice on top of it. Well, that ice bath has been the key to how our meat has tasted so good over the years. And we keep it anyway in an ice bath for five, six days anyway. So if you're not able to get out the next day, that's not a problem. You can keep that animal in an ice bath as long as it's staying cold and has ice inside there. It doesn't matter if the water, if it becomes ice water. Ice water is great and it leaches that blood out. Then when you get down, you can drain that out, put more ice on top of it. Mm -hmm. And it, it really helps to make quality uh, meat for you. And I get where he's talking about. There are a lot of guys I know hunting Colorado, and they're packing in, you know, a long way on horseback. Well, they can't – they ain't bringing a whole bunch of ice with them. But right. What I will tell them is to make sure in your truck or in your in your trailer, make sure you got coolers full of ice. Uh, fill them up before you guys hit the trailhead and, uh, you know, keep it in a, in a, in a shady location where it'll stay because – up in the mountains, that stuff's going to stay pretty good. It's not going to get above, you know, 70 degrees during the day. And then at night, it's going to get quite chilly, so you won't lose much ice. But at and the keep, end of the day, keep it in the shade. Yeah, keep it in the shade. And at the end of the day, when you kill a bull on the first day, you put it on the, your pack mule or, or whatever and bring him back down the mountain and put him on ice and go back up and help your buddies the rest of the time. And, you know, you but, can re refill your ice or whatever you may need. And for you guys that – you know, you have a base camp and you don't want to drive your truck out of there. We always, what's great is if you bring in your coolers, your <clears throat> empty coolers full of ice, they're ready because you pull that ice out you put that uh, deboned meat inside there, you cover with ice and you can hunt together for five days now and that meat is just fine. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. You just transfer. Yeah, I, I think uh, the meat stays really good and uh up to three days i would think and and just ice water well even when we shoot once if we've been in there three days and we bring it to the house and we put it in the garage it's going to be there another four or five days in ice bath and we make sure it stays on ice there but it is in ice bath and that really chills everything down and leaches it out total so yep. um 
Uh, and it's really great for processing it yourself. And then if you go to take that to the processor, you're not paying for all that bone. Well, so, Joe's, me Joe's method with leaving the skin on them when you're quartering them, uh, it helps keep the meat clean. Right. You know, you got the underside. I still try to carry some cheesecloth with me sometimes you have bags, uh, right. game bags. But at the end of the day, that skin protects it. So when you get it back to camp, all you got to do is take your fillet knife and skin that off and you can keep all your hair and all your dirt out of your meat. And that's what, man, that's what will make your meat taste bad and, and not getting it cooled down properly. So, uh, Gilbert, we're, uh, we're just under the five minute mark here for, uh, yeah. for this session of our show. Right. And, uh, I, I just want to answer this last question and before sure. we close out, and this one came from Ben from Washington, uh, Ben, glad to have your question. And Ben says that, uh, he wants to learn how to use a diaphragm call. He's been inspired by what we've been talking about as far as that. And it says, but he's never used one before. He hasn't used a turkey hunting or anything. And so he wanted to know what diaphragm call we would recommend for a beginner. And before we, uh, we're down to, we're about four minutes. So I'll get this out to you, Ben. What I recommend to people is the diaphragm call that best fits you. And I will tell you, and we're going to let Chav, jump in here because he's been going through this but for you guys that are out there if you get yourself a single latex and that could be um i think it's the cow calf if you're looking at uh, uh native by carlton um the contender by uh, uh elk 101 Rocky Mountain Elk Calls uh, make some of those single reeds that are just awesome. Primos, it would be they're white or they're black. Uh, and you probably want to get a, one of those calls. They're different size frames. The frame's either going to be half inch or five-eighths inch. And for somebody that's new, if you can get that half inch frame, it's going to help you out because you're not going to have to worry about some processes inside your mouth. So I think that one that you've been using – that's the native by Carlton. Yeah, it's the native by Carlton, and it's a uh, it's a red reed. Right, the I cow think, calf. I think it has a bow hunter on it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that that gave me success early because I was trying different different uh, reeds, and uh, I wasn't getting hardly any noise or <laughs> you know anything, just a little squeak here and there. Right. And the first time I tried that, I I got something decent, and then. Uh, I've been going from there, so that's been real successful for me. But, uh, yeah, you get that single dia you get that single latex, and you're going to have a lot more success getting a sound, and that's the whole key. Just start making sounds. Black so, Primos for me. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. love that Black Primos call. I mean, it's just right. been my favorite one. I have got the 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 bright orange one from one Elk One Hundred One, the Contender. It's it's good too. It's real good. Awesome. Yep. So, guys, uh, we've answered your, your questions in, in this session. We hate to have to cut it off for this one, but we got another one we're going to put out. And, uh, you know, in, in closing, um, Gilbert, what's, what's our next show? Well, next time on the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Series, we'll be off the beaten path, and uh, it'll be about the gutsy hunter. Right? Success so off the beaten path. Yeah, success off the beaten path and the gutsy hunter that's got the guts to go do that. So for sure, <laughs> that's going to be our next show. But in, in closing, guys, you know, Joe and Chad, what an awesome show we've had this week. Uh, and we're looking forward to next week's for sure. Uh, from Joe and Chad in New Mexico, I'm Gilbert Ornelas. God bless all of you out there. Kiss your wives and wives kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. Keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on the Blue Collar. Peace, peace. See you guys next time.